Welcome to the fourth part of the tutorial where we are making a platformer game in the default game engine. In the previous parts we managed to set up our project with the visual assets and created collision shapes. We also wrote a script to handle those collisions and applied gravity and allowed the character to move based on the velocity that we change with arrow keys as our inputs. All bundled together look like this. In this part we will continue improving our code base and we'll implement jumping mechanics. Bear in mind the repository with the project we are using here is open source and the link is always in the description. Each part has a separate commit there so you can start at whatever point you want to. First we will handle the jump button. Our current on input function is suited to only handle two keys for left and right movement. When we were defining inputs, we binded the space key to the jump action. Let's put our code in a condition for if the action ID is everything but our jump input binding, so not equal to hash the jump. Inside, we leave the code as it was. We can now add a conditional for when we are pressing actually the space key. We can write the else if condition when action ID is actually equal to hash jump, but you know, if the previous condition was not met, we would anyway end up here, so we can just write else. And inside this branch, when we want to jump in our velocity based implementation, there is nothing more to do than only apply velocity in positive y direction. Let's call it jump takeoff and initialize it at the beginning of the script as a local constant. At this point we should also set our self-ground contact variable in the situation when we start jumping to false, as we will take off the ground. Test if we can jump now and not mess up our current functionality. Looks like no, we can't take off, even though the implementation looks ok. Don't worry, I intentionally wanted to create such a situation to have the possibility to introduce you with the built-in debugger. It's very easy, maybe even easier than adding print functions in the code, and always forgetting to remove it after debugging. Click the space between line number and actual line in the editor to toggle a breakpoint in the given place. In our case, we want to check first if we are handling our space key properly. So check if we are getting into our newly created branch. Run the game with the debugger by clicking debug, start, attach, or with the shortcut F5. The game will start normally, but when we click space key, the execution will stop immediately and in the editor we will see more information. At first, the execution step is presented with a yellow arrow and it, as expected, is in the place where we put our breakpoint. You now see the onInput function is called only in the case of detecting the input and when its action ID was jump, we get into our new branch, so we should set the velocity. You can proceed one step further so that our assignment operation is completed and self velocity is updated. Use debug step over or shortcut F10. The position of the yellow arrow changed and at this point check out the right side of the editor. It is now converted into a debugger view with a call stack on top and the variables on bottom. Tables are automatically wrapped up, so click on the triangle next to the self table to expand its content and check if the velocity has now some value. Indeed we have. Check if we also set the ground contact variable to false. Ok, so everything here looks correct. Stop the debugger now with debug stop debugger or shortcut shift plus F5. If we properly change our velocity, then something with the update where we change the position based on the velocity must be wrong. Because there we are resetting our velocity every frame and it should be done on fixed steps, right? It's hard to put a breakpoint in the update function because we will have breaks every frame and couldn't possibly squeeze in any inputs, but we have something powerful down the sleeve in default. Conditional breakpoints. In the lines where we reset the velocity, put the breakpoints as earlier. Now right click on one of them and you can see a pop-up, where you can type in the condition. Let's check if we reset the velocity where we are actually wanting to jump, so we put into our velocity the positive takeoff speed in y axis. So check simply if self velocity y is larger than zero. This is an abnormal situation and might prevent us from performing a jump. So let's check if it occurs in our game. Run the game with the debugger attached or attach it while running. We are resetting the velocity while handling collisions before we get to the update and actually set our position to be somewhere above the ground, 
so the collision detection wouldn't be detected anymore. We found our issue. It happens because even though we are using a fixed update function to handle position, it looks like the physics engine is not adhering. It's because we didn't check a very important setting in the game project. In the physics section there is a checkbox Use Fixed Time Step, which by reading the documentation we can say that must be checked if we want also our physics engine to use fixed time step between changing world state. If we check it and run the game we should be able to jump now normally. If you run in with the debugger the condition is never met because we jump before resetting the velocity while handling collision. If we are talking about debugging while playing with physics it is also good to know that default has built in graphical visualization of collision shape that you can enable by sending to the system socket so prefixed with at sign and ending with colon sign a special message called toggle physics debug or you can mark debug checkbox in the physics section of the game project file. Ok, now you already noticed this code isn't perfect and when we hold the space key instead of jumping we could actually fly. So let's change conditions when the jump takeoff value is set as velocity to only react when the space key is pressed, so if action that pressed. Now we can jump once but we can click multiple times to have jumps in midair. It might be a double jump feature. But more jumps is a bit of a cheat, so let's for now limit it to one situation, so that the character can jump only when having the ground contact. Test it and check if the jump looks more or less ok. Let's work now on the animation for jumping, because right now we have only idle and run animations implemented. In our located inside the assets folder hero.atlas file, add another animation group called jump. Add images to it. Among the assets we are using there is one frame of jump animation for the pink alien, so after selecting it we can also set the playback mode of our animation to none. Current function for animating is really simple but based on action events and when we would like to add jumping states based on the actions of the player only it would be very tricky to make it right. We now have better indicators of the state of the character like velocity and ground contact variables. So let's write a new animate function that will now take self as a parameter instead of action. If we are touching the ground then we should, based on the velocity on the x-axis, if it is equal to 0 so we are not moving, play idle animation, but when in the other case the run animation. If we are not having a ground contact at all we should play jump animation. Now this function should not be bound to the inputs, but it is bound to the internal state in the self table. And because the self state could be updated in the loop, we should also update animation in the update loop. If we move it to our update function it should be better, but we should also prevent situations of constantly updating new animations every frame. So we could write a simple wrapper on the play flipbook function called play animation that would check if current animation that we will store in the self table is different than the new animation we would like to play and only then really update the flipbook animation of the sprite with the new animation and immediately change the saved self animation with the currently triggered animation. Add needed parameters to the function definition and change the lines where we are playing animations with a call to our new function with a correct name of the animation each time. We can initialize it in init, but as you will notice, the proper jump animation is triggered instantly when starting the game, because self animation is by default initialized with nil, which will be always different than the first new animation we would like to set. Play test now. I can show you another issue. Yes, we can't now fall correctly on the ground because there is no place to reset the ground contact variable when we are not detecting ground below the character. Simple fix for this is to reset the ground contact variable to false at the end of the update loop, so that it could be set again when the proper collision is detected. But there are more issues regarding collision handling. At this point we don't do anything when we run into the wall. The boxes should stop us here, as you can see when debug visualization is on. So let's now add more cases to our collision handling. For this purpose I also foretold in the previous part that normal and distant fields in the message table of the contact point response might be useful. Indeed, the normal vector shows the direction of the collision normal to the surfaces that are colliding at that point, and the distance represents the amount of the penetration of the collision shapes. 
Right now, in the onMessage function, we are only naively react to the collision with level as everything is the floor. But in platformers, we would also like to have walls and ceilings. So let's write a function to handle level collisions that will take self table as first argument because we will be modifying the internal state of the character, like its velocity or the ground contact variable and add normal vector and the distance from the contact point response message as next arguments. First, move our ground contact handling inside, but do it only when normal at y-axis is larger than zero, so the arrow is up and the collision happens to be with something below, with the floor. Everything should work the same after our changes. We can now do the same for where normal.y is lower than zero, so we are hitting something above, so the ceiling. We should also, in such a case, reset the velocity on the y-axis to zero. Also, if we are hitting something on the left or right side, such as the walls, we should reset the velocity on the x-axis to zero. To simplify our condition for both sides, we can use map.abs function on our normal.x that will take the absolute value and check if it is larger than zero. Everything should work fine now, but we can still move into the wall. We might even notice now that the character is slightly falling into the floor, especially when visual physics debug is enabled. I noted it at the end of the previous part, so let's implement now an announce compensation function. Our collisions are detected when the collision shapes might slightly overlap. Hence, we have a penetration distance in the message table, most of the time larger than zero. We should use this distance to compensate for the penetration and move the character this distance above the collision shape. But this would be true only if we would detect collisions with the floor perpendicular to the character's gravity. We would need to align it with the normal vector of the contact point to move the character. At the beginning of our handle level collisions function, multiply the distance by the length of the normal vector to compensate for a misalignment between distance and normal directions. Now, if we have a situation of penetration, so the distance is larger than zero, we should calculate the projection. We want to project our correction vector onto the vector created from the normal vector multiplied by the distance of the penetration. Our correction is undefined now. We want to accumulate corrections from different contact points when situations like this occur. So let's make it in a self table. Initialize it in the init as usual with an empty vector free. Now, when the projection of the accumulated correction is smaller than 1, so we exclude cases when the projection is overshoot, calculate the current compensation vector with the formula of the difference between the distance and the distance multiplied by projection, all multiplied by normal vector. Such compensation should be immediately added to current character's position and set as a new position using go.set position. Now accumulate the self-correction with this current compensation vector. The accumulation should be reset when we call update function, so at the end of it reset x and y components of the vector self.correction to zero. Because this compensation works in all directions, we can't now cross the walls, which is an additional benefit of it and the character should never fall through the floor. Right now we have a pretty robust controller for a platformer character. You can test it and get familiar with the code. In the next video we will juice it up with some effects. We will be adding particles and sound effects. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Special thanks to my current supporters and sponsors. And if you would like to be in the credits of such a video, check out the links and of course subscribe if you haven't yet. See you soon.